Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome Shabbat Shalom. to Brit on Messianic Synagogue and our Foundations of Messianic Judaism class. This class was designed to provide answers to questions people have about Messianic Judaism. As people come to our congregation, they come from either a Jewish background or a uh, Christian background or a background maybe from some other kind of faith or religion or a background of no religion at all. And so when you come here, that by nature, uh, we start to have questions. So what we want to do is answer those questions as quickly as possible so we can make sure that all of our uh, people that are attending are comfortable with where they are and what's going on and have a good foundation established under them. So that's what we do during this class. If you're watching online and you have a question that comes up, if you'll email the email address on the uh, Facebook post, it's raveric at britom.org, and if you email your question there, I'll answer it next week. If you're in the building and you have a question, there's paper on the table behind me and should be pens there, and you can write down your question, and then I will ask, uh, read them aloud and that way the people listening online can hear the question as it's being asked, and I will answer your question here. Now, I will not make up answers. Uh, if you ask me a question and there is no answer to it, I'm going to say I don't know that there's an answer for that. And if I don't know the answer, I'll say I don't know the answer to that. So I'm not going to make things up in order to do that. Um, we always open in prayer. There are a lot of people in need of prayer. We have... Um, a whole bunch of folks that are uh, ill, some uh, like Mary Grace, who fell yesterday and broke her uh, arm, her upper uh, humerus. So she's home with, uh, you know, getting uh, dealt with with that. We have people like Robin or Fred and others that have continuing illnesses and things that are going on that we want God to heal and deliver them from. But we also have. Uh, some that aren't here because they're uh, either they came in contact with or something, someone who has COVID, so we want to make sure they don't get COVID. And we have a whole bunch of folks that I know this is going to surprise some of you, but it got down in the 20s and 30s here in Florida, and people tend to get colds <laughs> when it gets wintertime. So we have people that just have colds. I, I know that's shocking in the realm of where everybody only gets COVID, but but uh, but but there are people like my wife who just have a winter cold, and so we want them to be healed and, and well also. Now she stayed home, uh, as well as some others from our congregation and our family that are sick because that's what sick people do is they stay home. So uh, so anyway, just pray for them. We have some uh, other requests in the room. If you have one, please raise your hand, Dave. I got an um, MRI for uh, some health issues that are really, you know, pretty big stuff. And I'm, I'm trying to get this figured out. So prayers for prayer for prayer. Dave. You had the MRI? I'm having another MRI done tomorrow. It's like a long 75 minute. When they say it's okay, 75 minute MRI. Well, like that. Monday. They're going to keep you still for 75 minutes. And listen, that is <laughs> I understand. I'm not. That wasn't being funny. I'm saying yeah, that's a. Yeah, so we'll be praying. That's a long time to be in that box with it going. Click. 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 But the pain is just yeah. tough. I understand. Yes. Brooke is having surgery Monday morning. Brooke is having surgery Monday morning. Sandy. Um, our youngest daughter. Um, breast cancer. She had COVID. Okay, youngest daughter uh, had breast cancer and has also had COVID, so we want uh, her healed and, and set free from all of that and delivered. Yes, Joanne. I've got a list, and I'm sorry. But we have um, Uncle Jerry and Aunt Cindy with COVID. Uncle Jerry and Aunt Cindy with COVID. Um, we have Sam who had a CAT scan yesterday. Sam had a CAT scan yesterday. Yeah, it's a one step closer to surgery for so it's prayer and a praise in a way. Okay. Uh, so there's that one. We have a very close and dear friend who's 92. She fell and broke her leg and is in rehab. 92-year-old friend who and broke their leg Ms. and Ann. fell. And Miss Ann. Miss Ann. And she's in rehab. Um, and then we have 
and that's really sad. She is a very social butterfly, much like our Miss a Mabel, and because of the rehab, she's no visitors, no nothing. Um, and then there's praise. 27 years for Sam and I yesterday. Yeah. Sam enjoyed 27 years yesterday. I have to tell you, Joanne has the patience of job. <laughs> no, I don't have a job. Um. <laughs> so we want to pray for that. Uh, bless, thank you. What a blessing to be here and, and participate in the joy of your celebration of 27 years. Also, I have to let you know there is some honey from honey infused honey stuff up on the counter that is their anniversary gift to you so if you have not received yours one of them is yours to grab hold of and take uh, joanne said she didn't want presents she wanted to give gifts for her anniversary so that's what they're doing for everybody uh, yes Susan. Yes. Um, it's looking like i might be going back to alaska to on the same calling as I was up there before. Okay, well, we will and, be praying for it. But the problem was I left and actually blot, blocked it out of my mind. I couldn't deal with it anymore because when I got up there, I lost my spirit. And I, I couldn't join up to the churches that was, and that's actually how I started coming to, to uh, study Judaism is because I started going to a, a group that was doing the, um, uh, the Old Testament. But the, uh, in going up there, I need to join up with people at times to get my spirit renewed. Absolutely. And well, the we purpose of going up there is to save the babies. That when they take these babies out on the fishing boats, in, uh, Eskimos are fishermen, that, the, that they get frostbite and they get, some of them get so badly damaged that you can't ever do anything with them. So the, the thing is to set up babies, set up schools for children okay. to, so that they don't have to take them out on the fishing boats. Okay, well we will pray that, that the Lord opens all the doors that need to be opened to accomplish that, especially for those little babies. Yes. Mom is having knee surgery Thursday yes. and Bryce in Oklahoma as of yesterday. Okay, so Bryce is in Oklahoma, prayed for him there, and Cheryl is having uh, knee surgery this week, yes. How is Will? Will is doing good. He's, I mean, it, when I say good, he had a very extensive break in his foot that's going to take a long time. He broke everything. I mean, it, not, not, you know, it, it, he did a, like a banged up job, so he didn't, he's, there's no halfway with Will. So they had to put pins and bolts and hook it together and do all kinds of things. And, and it was twisted and turned and broken. So it's taking time for it to heal, but he is healing well and he is recovering well. And I think he's actually a little ahead of their projection of where he would be at this point. But uh, he, he was up here the other day rolling around on this little roller. We, I took him to lunch and made sure he got out of the house and, and stuff like that. So... Uh, so he is doing better, but it's, it was a pretty dramatic. Uh, he's looking forward to getting back on roller skates, so I don't know. So <laughs> pray for him. <laughs> yes. I have a hundred year old Uncle Norman, and he is really starting to fall apart. He cannot get up and stand anymore, and so he, because he's got a sit, he's got those sores right. that develop. So I'd, I'd like you to pray yeah. for him. And remember to pray for Timothy and pray for Margo and Eliana and also Isaac and Israel, who are Margo and Eliana are having their bar mitzvah next week, and then Isaac and Israel, their bar mitzvah the next week, and their you know, kids going to get up and do something pretty big, so pray for them. Uh, anyone else real quick? Did anybody mention uh, Fred and Blake? Yes, ma'am. Jay? Um, Brother Ronnie and his family, or his family. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The Ron nation. And our nation. Yes. Yeah. Our nation. So, Abinam Malkin, our Father of King, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity we have as Mishpoka, as family, to gather together. Abba, we pray for all of those that need a healing touch, from those that uh, have diseases or sicknesses that we consider great in our minds, to those that are just fighting a 
common cold, which we don't even consider in our mind to be something dramatic, but to you it's all just a word spoken to bring about healing. And so we just pray that you would do, that you would increase our faith to believe and trust you for that. Father, we pray for our nation, we pray for our congregation, we pray for uh, our hearts to turn in such a way that we become addicted to ministry, to reaching out, to sharing, that we don't miss an opportunity that you present to us to share the good news of Messiah and to stand up for what your word says. And we thank you for all of this in Yeshua's name. We pray for Dave who's going to have to sit in that machine for so long, and we just ask that you'll bring shalom, shalom to his heart during that. And Abba, that they would find uh, either something they could take care of, yes. or Father, that by the time he gets in there, he will be completely healed and they won't see anything. Yes. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I have a couple of questions here already, so that I'm, I'm going to, uh, to read through these. And then if you have questions and you're in the house, write them down. If I run out of questions, I'm just going to talk for a while. So, uh, so that's, uh, I mean, even if I have questions, I'm still going to talk for a while, so I guess that doesn't change anything. <laughs> During the plague spoken by Moses, what is beeping? Nothing. Beeper. During the plague spoken by Moses, the plague of gnats, there is something making noise. That was a wind challenge. Okay. You guys have to help me with this. I'm not trying to be mean, but it really is distracting to me, and it might sound really low to you guys, but to me, I hear it really loud up here. So I want to try to go do this. So if you can turn your phones to the off position or silent when you come into the building, that would really keep that from happening. Um, so you have to set an alarm on your phone to remind you to turn it off. Uh, do that, uh, because it really does help. During the plague spoken by Moses, the plague of gnats, Exodus 8, uh, 12 through 15, was one in which Pharaoh did not ask for release, causing this next plague. Uh, flies seemed to be it followed. Did the gnats remain along with the flies? There is a, the, the, the answer to that question, first of all, the Bible doesn't give us an answer to that question. Uh, the answer to that question is that gnats don't live that long. And uh, so their life cycle is very short, and more than likely they just came, they were gnats, they died out. Um, so, but we don't know. There could have been gnats and flies, there could have been, it, we don't know. It's just not given us an answer in the Bible. But gnats don't live a long time. So, uh, maybe that helps with that. Uh, Moses was rescued as a baby by Pharaoh's daughter. He was raised in the palace. At the time of his striking down the Egypt, Egyptian slave beater, did the Hebrews know that he was a Hebrew? Uh, probably not. He would have been dressed in Egyptian clothes. He would have been looking like an Egyptian, very wealthy, pharaoh's son type person. So the, I doubt the average um, Egyptian would have known that he was not just an Egyptian doing that. Okay, Moses and Aaron's, Aaron's parentage. Uh, I asked for, for, that was just the question I got, Moses and Aaron's parentage. Let me ask you, when you give these questions to me, if you could use some other words in there also, so I actually understand what the question is. Uh, that helps to clarify a little bit, but I did ask to find out what this meant, and they were wondering about Moses' mother, who also happens to be his aunt, and they wondered, you know, is that kosher? Um, Yes, no, it was then. I don't think it's as kosher today as it was then. Uh, but remember, we have to look at a lot of things in here, and we think Moses' father's sister, that meant they both had the same parent. That's not necessarily so. The sister could be the, sis the daughter of another parent who's like a half-sister, step-sister, all that still happened uh, in there. So it doesn't mean that necessarily that the father and the, and the aunt were brother and sister from the same parents. You have to remember that at this time they had multiple wives, multiple others that were in there, so it doesn't necessarily mean that. So just, we need to kind of look at the greater context and say it, it may not mean what we think it means today because we don't have multiple wives and multiple families and stuff. So, that's that, which is a really good thing, by the way. 
I really believe that any one woman is enough for any one man, and likewise the other way around. So there's... Uh, so that's that. Why, why, was met, why could metal not be used on the temple stones? The reason for that is metal had to be prepared and made by man. Where stone, using it to cut stone and all was, was not something that man could participate and say, I made this better because I did this. Uh, so that's why. One of the reasons why. Solomon married a non-Hebrew woman. How come? Solomon married lots of non-Hebrew women. How come? <laughs> he had was it, 700 wives, or 300 wives and 700 porcupines. Other way, the was other way around. <laughs> 700 wives and 300 concubines. My, my son said when he was little, he said porcupines. I thought it was pretty close. So, but yeah, he did a lot of things that weren't smart or good. But God blessed him. God blesses people because of his covenant regardless at times of our behavior. Um, God, yeah, which is really good because none of us, except for my wife, is perfect in every way, would, 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 be, uh, would have anything if, we were, if, if our sins prohibited God from blessing us at all. None of us would be blessed. Good answer. So, so you know, we look at a lot of things. You look at, there's hardly anybody in the Bible that you can't look at and say, wait a minute. I mean, Abraham takes his wife and says, hey, I want to save my life here. Take her instead. Um, that was probably not something we would say, hey, look, that's the definition of a hero. Um, so there's a lot of that stuff that goes on that we have to pay attention to. But thankfully, God's grace is not determined by our righteousness. Amen. Determined by His righteousness. The last of Maryland's questions for this morning is, is it the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea? And the Hebrew actually says Sea of Reeds. But it is also the Red Sea. Um, because it's called both. You know, we have, like, it's like the, the uh, Sea of Galilee it is also the Kinneret uh, it's, uh, you know, so there's lots of different names for different things. I saw a documentary. Never listen to documentaries. <laughs> About how there conceivably could be a wall at the Sea of Reeds because of... Yeah, there's, there's, here's the thing. There are lots of documentaries. If you watch the, the uh, History Channel right. or some of those... They will always provide a, a, a reason why God's miracles were actually not miraculous. No, just the opposite. I no, so they'll say things like the there's a land bridge across the uh, the Sea of, uh, of Reeds or the Red Sea, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't that God had to drive the waters back a lot. It was just that it was a really low bit of water there, and it was just a little bit that stopped. Because they all they had this land bridge they could cross on, so it really wasn't this big miracle. It was just you know the water slowed down a little bit, and so they could get across the water and stuff. But the Bible doesn't say it that way. It says there was a wall of water on both sides of them. That's a significantly different thing than there was this low amount of water that kind of went to this natural dam, and then they walked across on that. Uh, the other side of that is if you just think about Pharaoh's army. All of his chariots, all of his horses, and all of his army were in that water. If it was a, a shallow bit of water, those horses and stuff could have drank the water <laughs> and not drowned it. It's hard to drown chariots and horses and stuff in eight inches of water. Uh, so, anyhow. So, but it is known as the Sea of Reeds in the Hebrew. The Hebrew says Sea of Reeds. It doesn't say Red Sea. So, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not the Red Sea. It's also called the Red Sea. Okay, in Shemot or um, Exodus 6-2, so we will look there. What is the significance of Hashem not telling them 
his name. In your opinion, why won't he let us use his name? Okay. First of all, let's look back a couple of chapters now that I read the whole question. <laughs> Okay, in chapter 3, uh, Behold, Moses said to God, in the Hebrew word there is Elohim, to God, Behold, I come to say to the people of Israel, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they shall say to me, What then is his name that I shall say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. Uh, and he said, Thus shall you say to the people of Israel, I am sent you to me. And God Said moreover to Moses, thus you shall say to the people of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my forever uh, name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. So let's start there because this is actually where the discussion about the name of God comes. Now, God speaks to Moses in these, this section, and he says, This is my name, but uh, Abraham did, I mean, but. Uh, you know, they didn't know my name before this. I mean, your fathers knew me as El Shaddai, or, uh, and, but they didn't know my name. Yet when you look at Genesis, you see the name yod heh in Genesis when God speaks. Here's the thing. We have done to God's name what we've done with almost everything else in the Bible. And that's made something very easy to understand, very difficult, complex, controversial, and something that causes division instead of unity. When God said, this is my forever name, he didn't tell Moses, yod He said, I am that I am, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is my forever name. And then afterwards, he talks about yod heh and that goes on, but... He doesn't say in this verse, here's my forever name, yod heh vav -Heh. He says, tell the people I am that I am, and, uh, and that, this, that, that the I am has sent you, and that this is my forever name. Uh, here's what we know. In the Bible, and up until just a little while back, your name wasn't just whatever your parents called you. Uh, that's why in biblical times they would seek the Lord about what to name their child, because the name of your child uh, had to do with who they were, what they were. You know, uh, Moses drawn forth is what his name meant, because he was drawn forth out of the water, and so it attached something meaning to his name. Nowadays we go, you know, I really like the name Bob, so I'll call my child Bob, or Robert, or Andrew, or Timothy, or... Sam, or John, uh, or any of those things. Nowadays, we've got all kinds of names that are just made up words. People use my, 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 my and not made up names, but my son-in-law, a uh, son and daughter-in-law, uh, Andrew and Melissa, their two uh, children have Hawaiian middle names, uh, which they did just because Pammy has difficulty calling them their middle name, so she can't say, you know, like with Andrews, Andrew Stevens. So she gets mad, she can say, Andrew Stevens, you know, but she can't do that with the grandbabies so because she can't say their middle names. So, so they, they took that weapon out of my wife's arsenal <laughs> against the children. But um, but we we don't, now, now I will tell you this, that even though they named them Hawaiian names, their names mean gift of God and, and blessing from God. They thought about the names. They didn't just pick out a name, but they, they thought about the name. And uh, same way with the, the other ones. They all had reasons for their names. Um, today we don't do that as much. But in the Bible, when you say the name of, you're not talking about like John or Tom or Cindy or, or that or what the letters or the sounds are, you're talking about who they are, their character, their nature. If you get all of the names of God, you can write a whole book 
that describes his nature. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He is our peace. He is all of those things make up who he is. And the exclamation point name at the end of the long line of names is he is our salvation. Amen. Which is the name Yeshua. So that's that's it. So he did let us use his name. He just we just don't use the the four letter tetragrammaton that we don't know how to pronounce because that's not his name. It is a title or name given to him. Uh, there's lots of discussion. What does that mean? What was well Yohe Bahe, if you just there's no vowels there. Uh, if you just do the letters, it's like you're breathing in and out. So does it represent the breath of God in mankind? Does it represent that? Uh, there's lots of thoughts on what it is, but the point is that nowhere in the Bible does it say we're supposed to proclaim an incantation using a term or a word uh, like sorcery or witchcraft, that if you just say this word at the end of the set sentence, uh, it miraculously becomes what you want it to be. Uh, that's not how it is. And the one, you know, it, throughout the New Testament, when we read the writings about Yeshua, he answered lots of these questions for us. Uh, for instance, this particular question, they said, how should we pray? And Yeshua didn't answer. This was a perfect opportunity for him to say, okay, guys, all those rabbis, all these, these Jewish leaders that prohibit you from using the four-letter name of God, which has the power of God. It was used 7,000 times in the Torah. It's this, this, this. And you guys should be using this name. It's been robbed from you. That was a perfect opportunity for him to do that. But he doesn't do that. He responds by saying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, revered, honored is your name. If he was going to... If, I mean, of all the things he corrects in the Bible, if this was such a driving force of deception... Robbing the people of God of their authority and power to use that four-letter name so that things could get accomplished. Isn't that the opportune time for Yeshua to say, okay, guys, this is messed up. I mean, because uh, he does that other places. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about one of them in just a minute when I answer Sam's, one of Sam's questions. But he, he's asked, how do we pray? And he said, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. He didn't just say, don't just throw this four-letter word around, but he put a agreement and reinforced the teaching that it's not about a four-letter name. It's about him being our Father who is in heaven. And, uh, you know, so, so that's... Um, the way it, it, it is to me. So that's my answer. I hope that answers your question sufficiently. Uh, but that's why. And why will he let us use his name? We can do anything we want to. Uh, it's just a matter of it being inappropriate to use it in the way that most of us do. So I hope that helps. Okay. Same question. Yeshua says, no one can serve two masters, for either we will hate one and love the other, or we will be devoted to one and despise the other. Matthew 6, 4, uh, 6, 24 says, Israel could not serve both Pharaoh and God, neither can we serve two masters. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 6. Uh, 17 through 18. So first I want to turn to the Matthew verse so that we can read it. And while my Bible computer is opening to the appropriate page, I hope, um, it says, in the context of the scripture, are we not as believers to stand up against a tyrannical government and big tech media who infringe and violate uh, our God-given freedoms? Are we allowed the freedom of religion, are, are we to allow the freedom of religion, of speech, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and now under the new administration, the new Congress and Senate, the reinstitution of taxpayer funded infanticide and murder of babies in the womb? Uh, where are we to draw the line in this fight we have been forced into now as believers? What is our responsibility in this earthly fight of righteousness versus evil? What verse? 
Um, well, he, Romans 6 is what he, in the, the thing, but, but Matthew 6.24 is the verse that I turn to. Okay, so first of all, Sam, you're going to be disappointed if I answer. Um, but not at the beginning, but I think that by the end of it, you'll be happy with me again. <laughs> um, I hope. We'll find out. Uh, Matthew 6 is a horrible series of verses to use, and so is Romans to make your position. Uh, Matthew 6 is specifically about the hypocrisy of religious leaders and the believers not following after the false or wrong teachings of religious leaders. It doesn't have anything to do with government. And so it's important. It says, beware the practice, uh, of practicing your righteousness before others. Be seen from them. You have no reward in heaven. For, so when you do sadaka, do not sound a trumpet before you as hypocrites in the synagogue, do in the synagogues. So that they may be glorified by men. And it's, this is all teaching them about what the religious leadership of the day is doing that's contrary to what believers should do. So the context is not this is the government versus us because they were under Roman government. And this is talking about religious leaders. Likewise, Romans 6 is talking about our sins, not the sins of others. It's saying... You shouldn't sin anymore. You've been saved. The old man is dead. You're supposed to be dead to sin. Now live above sin. That is talking about us. So neither of your verses uh, are applicable to your, uh, to your comments. But on the other side of things, there are lots of verses that I could look up and come up with to validate our standing up against uh, a tyrannical government and not only... Verses, but I spent a good part of last Saturday's class speaking my heart about how um, how we should do that or, or what we should do. I, I will say a couple of things in doing this. Um, first of all, I am not sure at this time that I would see it as a biblically mandated thing to rise up and start a civil war against our government. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm going through a list. I, I'm not suggesting that you're suggesting that. <laughs> uh, but I don't know that this is a, but what there are things that the, look, the body of Messiah, and, and I'm going to use that term to include everybody and every heretical Christian form there is, just for the sake of this argument. We have always been reactive rather than proactive in what we do. We always let somebody do something and then we try to fix it after it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the things we need to do is get proactive in legal challenges and getting our... In other words, we've let the ACLU choose cases, bring them before courts that they choose and establish laws that then take years and years and years to undo. We should, instead of being defensive, we should be proactive, and we should be promoting lawyers to take cases to uh, favorable courts, which now are the majority of the courts in our country because of the positions that were filled by our current president, uh, including the Supreme Court, which now leans toward our side, although uh, mm. I'm very disappointed with Roberts. Uh, I'm not going to say Roberts' name because it would be inappropriate. <laughs> oh, um, so, but I'm disappointed with his his rulings of late, but the whole court is, leans towards a conservative stand, but we, we tend to be it's kind of like we, we, we believers and, and Bible believers, regardless of, of their brain, um, tend to do dumb things and then fight against our dumb thing. Uh, for instance, the Harps Accord was created, so we rejected the Harps Accord. You couldn't use the Harps Accord for worship. It had to be only singing. So all music written for Harps Accord was ungodly because we wouldn't let it be used for godly purposes. And then they came out with the next instrument, and then we adopted the Harps Accord because it was no longer the evil it was, but now the next thing is... And we did it with radio. You know, you couldn't be on the radio. Radio was ungodly. Movies were ungodly. Don't go to the movies. So we cede it to the enemy, 
And then we argue against what the enemy's doing. Like, we tell them we don't want to make godly movies, so then they make all trash movies. We don't want to go to the movies. Godly people don't go to the movies. That's horrible. We shouldn't do that. So then they make all these horrible movies, and then we pick at the movies. We did the same thing with the internet. Same thing with television. Education. We did it with education. We want separation. We don't want to force our religion on people. Uh, we're gonna, so we let the secular humanist present that religion to all of our children. Um, so I think that we're, it's time for us to stop being reactive and start being proactive. Uh, in in making changes and holding on to things that we need to have, um, so so that's that. On uh, the same note, Rabbi, they canceled the March for Life because Mr. Mayor said don't do it. Right? Yes. yes. Now, do you no, think no, that the people no, should no, have no. said, "Hey, we're not listening to your stupidity," and did the march anyway? Because that was... I'll tell you what I would have done if, if I were the people in charge and I, I presented this up the ladder to try to get it done. I just wouldn't have done it on city property. Right. I'd have said, this is Highway 29 to public road. We're just going to march all the way up the side of Highway 29. We don't need the city's permission to take a walk. Okay, everybody on Facebook, at 12 o'clock, we're all going to take a walk up Highway 29. Get, you know, walk with your family, walk with your friends. We're just going to do but, but we don't do that. What we do is we go, oh, well, I guess we'll just, you know. Virtual. We'll do it virtual, which is not horrible, but it's not the thing. It's just not the thing. It, it's, it, you know, and so, I mean, we did that in the past. We, we've done things where they said, you can't do this. And we said, okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. We'll do it over here. You know, people joked about, we can't have worship service, but we can go to Walmart. Let's all meet at Walmart at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and, and, and people joked about it, but we should have been doing that. And if we had not been able to have service, we would have done that. We would have went to somewhere and just had service. We're not going to not have services. And so, so the thing is, we... we need to be proactive in these things. And if the city says you can't use city property, say, fine. We'll all just get together and walk up the road. We'll all take a nice long walk. Everybody, it's outside. No masks, no problems, sunshine, beautiful weather. Let's just all take a walk up the highway uh, and, and, and do that. But we don't do that. What we do is say, well, I guess we just won't do this. Government said we can't do it. That's ridiculous. But it's what we do. So what I'm saying is we need to get proactive. We need to get a backbone. It doesn't mean we need to go out and beat people or arm ourselves and fight the government. Not, and I'm not saying, look, let me say this very clearly for those watching online. It may come to that. I hope to God it never comes to that. I, you know, look, if you've ever been in or around war, you don't want to see that. And I'm not promoting that in any way, but there, there is, I mean, our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence were written so that we would have, if this happens, that's why we have a Second Amendment. It's not, they didn't come back from fishing and hunting that day and say, you know what, we ought to preserve our right to fish. No, it's not what it says. And I'm not, and again, I'm not promoting it, but I'm saying that we have to do this in the right way. Now, um... I think that, uh, that if we do it the right way, and we rise up the right way, and we stand the right way, that we can bring about change. But it has to be because we're doing godly things the godly way. Amen. Right. What happened at the march, and listen, I don't, everybody's got their opinions. Uh, I'm not going to share my opinion on the video because, you know, I don't want to get arrested. Antifa started. No, I don't think it was Antifa. I, I honestly, I'll tell you what, I'm going to say it online. I think it was the social media companies promoting the assault on the Capitol. That's my opinion. I could be wrong. I'm willing to be that. Who benefits from that? Democrats. Yeah. The Democrats didn't benefit. <laughs> Biden was going to be, all they were going to do was present the case, and Biden was going to be uh, elected 
but in the presidential election. Trump be easier. Hmm? No, 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 no. <laughs> Trump was out of there nine in what twelve days, fifteen days. Trump was gone. Any influence he might have had. No, nope, it doesn't. He's it doesn't. And the influence I'll talk about in a second. But the Democrats didn't get anything out of that except some noise and to be able to point at Christians. And say, see how evil these Christians are? Because the Christians yeah. were standing next to these people. So because they were standing next to them, they got to imply that this was Christians doing this. Trump didn't get anything out of it. He'd been better off if nothing happened because they were promoting his case. They were actually going to finally, in front of the public, air the grievance. In front of everybody, it was on national TV, everywhere, on internet, everywhere, that these guys were going to share the case for irregularities in the election. So Trump didn't get any positive out of it. The only people that got positive out of this were the internet companies like Facebook, Twitter, and those, because they got Trump off of them, and they got rid of their competition, and they are able to keep the 230 section status, which allows them to not be sued for content on their uh, platforms. And because they have 230 status, you can't sue them for not having content on their platforms. So the only people that took it, that got any positive out of this, is the internet companies like Twitter and Facebook and all. And we're not gonna go into questions and comments on this. But I'm just saying, if you have the ability to share all kinds of information to thousands of people, and you have thousands of people working for you to help do that, and you wanted to put a stop to all this stuff, sending messages on white supremacists and Nazis' uh, websites telling them to come to the Capitol is really easy for you to do because you have the mechanism and control over your site to do that. We have a million people there, mostly senior citizens, because that's the people who could go up there. Other people were working. Um, and and this, was, this was an instigated event, I believe promoted by social media conglomerates. My opinion, I could be wrong, it's a conspiracy, I know it, but it's my opinion. I'm not telling you you have to believe it or even accept it. I'm saying to me, when I look at something, I follow the money and I look for the benefit. Who gets benefited by this? Not the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, not believers. The only ones that get benefit out of this is social media giants. They got rid of their competition, I don't believe they saved the 230 status, and they got rid of conservatives off of their, gave them an excuse to get conservatives off of their Platforms. Amen. The only people, yeah, like Sam, who got thrown off. Um, so, look, that's my opinion. I could be wrong. I am not saying this as, as something that you should all go out and say, my rabbi said this. This is just me being a human being saying, when I look at something, I say, this happened. Who would have benefited from this? And the people that don't benefit from it is you and I. Amen. The American people. Period. Regardless of your political background, we don't benefit. So, anyhow, I've got three minutes left. I don't want to talk about that anymore, but I'm saying we need to be aware. Yes. Don't blame the Democrats. Don't blame the Republicans. Put the blame where it belongs. These are crazy people who were instigated to do crazy stuff to make it bad for everybody else. And it's exactly what I would do if I were people trying to do what they're trying to do. To incite hatred and violence among people. That's the reason why the other riots and protests weren't removed from the internet and from these platforms because they want to foment hatred. They want us to hate each other and they want to stop believers from being on the post. They want to stop uh, righteousness from being on the internet, on those platforms. They want to stop all that stuff. And, and they're, look, we need to do something to combat that. The, the way, and here's the thing, somebody, and I know I have like two minutes left. Somebody sent me an email that said, um, nobody needs to go on Facebook for 
from Friday to Saturday to show them just how much they need us. Well, first of all, it's not going to show them anything. That's like the old thing back when they said, don't buy gas on Tuesdays. So, so what they did is they raised the price on Monday and Wednesday, and everybody had to get gas anyhow. It doesn't change anything. People aren't, look, we can't get people to come to synagogue if it rains. Do you think people are really getting off of the Internet? I mean, it, it's, it's not going to work. We need to do stuff to, instead of being reactive, we need to be proactive. Amen. And we need to start posting godly things. We need to start posting this. We need to stop arguing amongst ourselves and start sharing the good news. We need to be active in doing what we are called to do. Because the truth is, not one person in here, unless you are serving in the active military, have a calling to save this nation from destruction. It's our home, and we want to, but the Bible didn't call us to save the United States. Remember, the United States isn't even mentioned in the Bible. Amen. We were called to build the kingdom. Amen. And that's what we need to do. And we need to be a little more proactive Amen. instead of reactive in doing that. And I'm now out of time, so we're going to cut this class off. We'll start back up in a few minutes. Please, nobody move yet in here, but go ahead and cut off the thing.